Fantastic. Well, Brian, David, thank you so much for that fascinating session. Um, I'm now absolutely delighted to welcome two great friends of SIN to the stage. We're going to start by hearing from Jim Spaeth of Sequel Partners, who's going to provide an update on SIM's identity resolution data matching study, which is turning into a really fascinating piece of work. And we're then going to move into a, a panel discussion um, moderated by Jim's partner, Alice Sylvester, um, talking about ID resolution as one of the building blocks of converged TV measurement. So Jim and then Alice, take it away. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, let me share the story of our study to date with, uh, with everyone. It's been quite a journey. Uh, let me begin with the question, why are we doing this, right? So everyone knows about the importance of data matching to both advanced audiences, to attribution modeling, and to um, lots of other things in our ecosystem, but we'll just focus on those for the moment. And that role requires matching viewers to outcomes. In this little example here, we've got auto intenders. And obviously, the two data sets don't overlap perfectly. Nothing in our world overlaps perfectly. So there is an intersection between the two data sets. And you always have to ask your question, OK, well, maybe the source data was wonderful, but what happens to the match data? Do we have enough data? And even in the era of big data, sometimes the matching process and the, uh, uh, you know, the use case you want to apply it to just don't result in enough data. The other question is, has the data been changed? Has the data been biased in any way through the process? And that's, that's a question that, that I have seen no evidence uh, about to date. And it's a really important question for the industry to get some perspective about. And having, uh, this, ha having unveiled, revealed, let's say, some, uh, you know, the, the results of, of that kind of matching process, then, then the question is, okay, and what do we do about it, right? So that's, that's really the important question here is as we move forward, what are our best practices in maintaining data integrity? And uh, it's taken a while, but we, we have the leading um, identity resolution providers, you can see them on the left, all agreed to participate. And we have uh, test data providers on the right, Samba and TiVo, Place IQ. Um, we have a little wrinkle going on right now with the demo data. So for, mo for the moment, that's, that's TBD. But, uh, but what are we going to do with these, these data sets? It's pretty simple. We're going to match data, and then we're going to compare the original data to the matched data. What's the match rate? How much data have we retained? And do the, has the data been changed in any way, biased in any way that's significant and, and material? after the match. And that's going to involve a series of eight matches. You, I won't walk you through them all. We're, we're going to take step by step, piece by piece, to understand as one data set is matched to another, what happens to it in that process. So we've had a pre-phase, right? We're not ready. We're, we're, we're still lining up all of the pieces that we need here. Uh, but we have had um, in-depth interviews with all of the identity providers. And in that process, we've, we've, learned, we've learned a fair amount about the, the matching process. So that we've learned some of the providers will start with households. Uh, often that those are identified with a postal address or a zip 11. Um, and then devices in the household, like a smart television connected TV are associated with that household. And then persons, or in some cases, masked persons or personas are associated with the household. And then uh, the devices of those people, like mobile phones, get matched to the household. Others will start at the device level or the, even the person's level. So th there may be email as an identifier, for, for example, and then they build up to households. And the way in which this is done really depends on, on the kind of foundational data sources of the identity resolution provider. What business did they come to us from? and what resources do they have to, to work on. Some maintain separate household and persons graphs, others link them. Ultimately, usually you can follow the path from, uh, from device to person to household with, with, a, with a, a, a highly deterministic set of data. Some probabilistic associations are, are necessary, but, uh, but it appears it, it's, it's, it's much in, in the minority. Um, we've learned that ID uh, identity resolution providers assemble as many match keys as possible, filling in gaps, and they draw on many, many data sources. We've got a list of, of match keys here, and it's pretty much everything you've ever worked with or thought about. Um, there's a quality assurance process in each one of these. Uh, as data becomes associated with their graph, it's checked 
every way imaginable. And uh, when there's a high degree of certainty, it's associated with the household or the person or the device in that graph. And when not, it's often, often rejected. Privacy is their top priority. In, in going through these processes. We've also learned that IP addresses aren't fixed. Uh, they may be purposely cycled or uh, routers get rebooted uh, and things like that. So the freshness of IP address is critical and everyone's well aware of that and has their eye on it. We're also aware the street addresses may not be 100% accurate due to move rates. So you know there, there are issues that we want to explore here. Um, we also found out that the majority of the set-top box data matches go through Experian. It's 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 where they started in the business, and what that means is very often matching set-top box data requires two steps: the match to Experian and then the match to a third-party uh, data provider. Oh, I'm sorry, identity provider. So where are we right now in this process? Uh, we've learned that great efforts are made to ensure the accuracy, the coverage, the completeness of identity graphs and tons and tons of data are, are leveraged. It's pretty re remarkable. But we still don't know what happens to the viewing and the outcome data after it's transformed through the matching process. That's the question um, that's really important for us to answer as we try to um, come up with representative insights about, the, about viewers uh, and, and how advertising impacts them. Uh, so th then the question becomes, once we've understood that, how do we improve the process? So we don't know that yet, but we will know soon. We, we have the pre-phase report, the, these learnings that we've, we've gathered uh, is in the final veracity checks. We wanna make sure what we, what we publish is, is accurate. Uh, we're still chasing a few legal agreements. That seems to be the story of our lives here. Uh, we're working out technical specs and timing for data delivery, but we are shooting for final delivery in June. So it's very exciting. Personally, I can't wait to see what we discover here. Um, and I think it's gonna be enlightening and useful for the entire industry. So that's where we are. Um, now I want to uh, introduce my partner, Alice Sylvester, who will be uh, moderating a panel of the industry's leading identity resolution providers who will discuss some of these issues in depth. Alice? Hey, thanks, Jim. Good presentation. It's very clear what we're doing. Um, I'm very pleased to um, be moderating a panel of my friends in the identity resolution business. And I'm going to ask everyone, starting with Amy, to introduce themselves, where they're from, and tell us a little bit about your role in the whole ecosystem. Thanks, Alice. Um, I'm Amy Irwin. I lead strategy and partnerships for Experian Marketing Services. At Experian, we're probably best known for our credit bureau, but at Experian Marketing Services, we provide marketers with data identity activation and measurement products. And uh, we're also known for our privacy-friendly matching. As uh, Jim just mentioned, we've been supporting data-driven TV for many years, and we recently acquired TapAd, uh, which is a leader in digital identity resolution to help us with our digital identity capabilities. Thank you. Tim, if you'd like to unmute and uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do and where you are in the ecosystem. Yeah, Tim Jenkins. I um, head up uh, our audience and identity business as well as corporate development for uh, Caden. Caden is a uh, cross-screen TV platform that um, focuses on uh, delivering audiences to TV screens. Our particular role is um, uh, we actually provide the identity element that uh, works with the third-party ecosystem companies like like Experian and and LiveRamp to help bring audiences to screens. I'm not sure I understand that, but excellent. Um, Max, could you tell us a little bit about where you are in the ecosystem and a little bit about your job? Hey, I'm Max Paris. I head up our identity resolution and addressability solutions at LiveRamp. LiveRamp is a leading data connectivity platform. Um, for the safe and effective use of data. Um, we solve, uh, what, what we sell for is helping companies and their partners connect, control, and activate data to engage customers. Um, and we're interoperable and in neutral infrastructure. So we can deliver end-to-end -end addressability um, to, to brands, agencies, TV companies, and publishers. So TV is one big space that we play in. And we partner with many of the um, other panelists on, on a variety of initiatives. Yeah, I don't get that either, but we're going to talk about that. Allison, can you introduce yourself, take yourself off mute and um, introduce yourself, please? 
Hi, Alice. Thanks for having me. I'm Allison Dietz, um, and I'm representing Newstar, a transunion company. So I'm in a unique position that I get to represent both of my companies here today. Um, but we, at, at, at Newstar and TransUnion, we have our, our marketing solutions offering, which really encompasses audiences, identity, and analytics. Um, so, you know, we really kind of focus on that end-to-end -end and helping brands and marketers really identify the audiences that they're trying to reach and help them then measure whether or not there's an impact associated with the, the, that activation. Awesome. Um, my first question, I'm going to go a little off road this morning, um, but my first question is, um, Tim, can you explain to us what the role of identity is in television data, how important it is? Yeah, so, it, you know, it's kind of a new thing to TV. I mean, TV has been very dependent on Nielsen data and measurement um, historically, and that um, currency, that measurement currency has kind of lost its luster. And so what uh, TV has started to evolve towards is something we've seen in the digital realm for a long time, particularly with, with you know, sort of the advent of CTV, is that we now have the ability to pair both household and person level data directly to somebody viewing a program on TV. And why that's important is you now can measure the value of that impression on an outcome in a real world transaction like a purchase in a store. Okay, excellent, thank you. Max, do you think television, uh, do you think the entire, fate of the television industry today and in the future rests solely with identity resolution? Identity resolution is certainly going to help the fate of TV. There are going to be multiple currencies. There will be new currencies that pop in, as Tim was talking about. And the only way that we will be successful as an industry is for them to interoperate with each other. And interoperability doesn't just mean matching. Matching is a key piece of that, but everybody has different representations and perspectives of identity. And we need those to not only talk to each other, but talk to each other um, at fidelity so that we can actually activate these key use cases for marketers. So what, what that means specifically is there's a lot of conflicts that arise between different perspectives of identity. So not only do you need to interoperate all these different currencies, you need them to interoperate in a way that makes sense. And I think the SIM study is gonna, you, you see that when you take a bunch of varied types of data and start to match them. Great, Allison, when I think about the partnerships that in that identity resolutions companies have, I, I the only way I can visualize it in my head is like a London tube map, okay? So everybody comes in and everybody, you can go this way and you can go this way, but everybody is completely interconnected. Um, and then I wonder if, are we all doing the same thing? Do we have a different, do each of you have a different role in the industry and how would someone possibly know who to work with and why? That's a great question and a loaded one a little bit. So partnerships do matter a lot in the, in the world of, of TV, but not just TV, beyond TV as well. Um, as we think about, you know, data deprecation and privacy and the rise of privacy regulation, it's important for us to be able to, you know, for marketers in the, in the industry to still be able to both, you know, reach those audiences across, you know, the different platforms and, and, and mechanisms, mediums for us to reach our audiences, but also measure accurately whether or not that is actually driving an outcome. So, you know, I think there it will continue, as, as Max was sort of suggesting, identity is going to continue to play a role there, being able to connect the dots across those different publishers and platforms um, and those different mediums. And it's going to continue to be even more important, especially if you look at, you know, consumer behavior, which is really what's driving this, is that change in consumer behavior and way, in the way consumers, you know, consume video content. That's what's really try, forcing us to think about how do we do this in a way that's efficient and effective um, so that we're reaching our audiences in a meaningful way and not you know, inundating them with repetitive messaging. Um, so I think that that's gonna continue to be important. You know, to answer your question a little bit more specifically in terms of looking at you know, the different providers and the differences, I think it's important to really understand, you know, obviously Jim presented a little bit around match rate. Match rate is part of the equation. You know, we believe it's an important thing to continue to monitor 
Um, but you know, I always tell this example. We have an, um, uh, one of our heads of product is his name's Ryan Angle. He sits in our New York office. We actually have a second employee with the exact same name. And if you really think about match rate and throwing a bunch of identifiers in, you would see the same IP address, the same name, you know, similar email, same company. You might match those two individuals together, but they're two separate households. So you really have to think about the quality of the match in addition to just the match rate to make sure that you're getting, you know, a really impactful, um, you know, audience reach because those are two different households, two different buying patterns, and you want to make sure that you're, you know, you're thinking about what is that, what is the, what is the, um, the company doing in terms of identifying that match, but also, you know, what data are they throwing away? What are they using to kind of delineate between those two humans? Awesome, Amy. Um, Experian has a kind of a unique role in this industry. It seems like an awful lot of television data is matched through Experian first. How did that come to be? And how do you know that the role you're playing um, is, uh, is correct? How do you know that the data that gets produced going through your system is correct? Yeah, no, that's a good point. So we have, uh... We've played a critical role. We certainly um, have integrated with all the MVPDs and all that underlying subscriber data. Uh, so when you think about how TV has traditionally been targeted, it's been targeted at the household level, and that's linked to um, you know, a postal address and a household. And we've linked uh, and matched that in a privacy-friendly way for many years. And what that allowed us to do is connect all that data, that subscriber data, to other data sets. Uh, whether that be Experian data, where obviously we have a lot of consumer data, or it could be other third-party data, or it could be marketer first-party data, or it could be connecting to the rest of the industry. And a lot of the folks, um, you know, they're on this call, whether whether it's measurement providers or other um, critical players in the ecosystem that allow for TV to be um, allow for TV to be both data-driven. Um, as well as measured and allow for that analytics and optimization that ultimately has happened in the online world for many years, um, but is only, uh, you know, sort of, sort of slowly come to, um, you know, to the vast majority of the, the television world. Excellent. I also want to encourage my panel to uh, ask questions or talk over each other. That's always much more fun than me just um, firing questions. However, before y'all do that, let me get this next question in. Max, um, how do you know, how do customers of yours know that your system ultimately produces a high quality, accurate solution? What kinds of things are people doing to determine that? Tim, you no. can answer that too. Anybody can answer that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. So internally, we have a, a, a lot of work that we put into quality and accuracy, whether that is specific data sources that we're looking at that are sources of truth that are held out of the data that we actually produce in our graph. Data science, um, a lot of models that we run to provide a score of our graph to understand like how it measures against those sets of truth. But ultimately it comes down to um, me in product. I do a ton of discovery and talking to customers on what their use cases are and how our solutions are working for the use case. And, and that's really where I get a lot of, hey, is this solution working for you? Is it accurate en enough for your needs? Are you seeing what you expect to see? And um, when we don't, we dig into that to understand like what is the origin of that? Because there's so many different translations and connections that occur along the path of TV measurement that it's, it's hard to pinpoint in certain cases, but it's a combination of really looking at the customer's use case. And, and we have a lot of really strong customers that we collaborate with closely on, on their use cases, as well as internal things that we do when we build our graph. I mean, of course, we like to build our graph and we like to think our graph is built perfectly. Um, but it, when you use it in the wild, that's when you see any sort of differences in perspective of identity that could cause results that are unexpected by our clients. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that um, that validation is done uh, at the end of the system. Does it, do the numbers make sense? Do they reflect the world that we know? I, I appreciate that, but I, but I'm I'm not certain though that that is exactly the only place where we should be sort of looking at validation. Certainly, absolutely plays a role. But what kind of truth sets are you looking at for television data? What kind of truth sets do you have on demos or? Um, 
uh, product usage or things like that? How would you even know whether you're, the stuff that you're creating is accurate? Yeah. We look okay. at, at hold, hold out um, sets and sorry, I'll let you go, Tim, as well. Yeah. But a lot of the, the data that we look at is really fundamentally at the identity level. So we have sets of data based off of their source are highly unique and highly accurate because of the nature of what they are that we use for this. But Alice, you bring up a good point. Like ultimately you're connecting different data types together that that you want to evaluate against that. So there, there's a lot that you have to do to actually bridge that gap from the identity realm to the you know third party data realm or whatever data elements that you're or attributes that you're putting on an individual or on a household. Yeah, yeah, what do you think? I mean, I, at yeah, Newstar, so we have our own demographic summit, proprietary demographic summit segmentation that you know looks at psychographics, demographics, and that's one of the things that we we can do. As Max is describing, as you know, throughout the process of, of that matching, and that's one of the things that goes into you know identifying and understanding you know the the data, the underlying data that we're we're using as part of our match. Um, but I think it's also important to look at things like conversion and attribution. So, you know, it's not just about what's happening in that process, but also the outcome and being able to monitor how that outcome is it making sense. If you're getting a bunch of conversion from someone who's not been exposed, you know, that then starts to kind of indicate whether or not there's something happening in that match. So I think it's important to look at it as, as a stepwise, you know, in the process, as, as Max is sort of describing of, you know, doing the match, but then also what is the outcome you're trying to drive to? Yeah, we're, yeah, we're highly, the we're highly, cases are, oh, go ahead. So we're, we're highly dependent on uh, customers' truth sets. So, you know, we can, we can process as much scientific data or non-scientific data as, as the next guy. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to how does it really overlay against the customer's data? Because that, that's really going to be one of the best indicators in their minds of accuracy. And then um, to an earlier Wait, point. One second. First party data isn't all that great either, right? You're, you're always going to have problems. We should just, you know, be clear. There is no perfect data set on this planet, yeah. right? So anybody who claims that they're 100% accurate is not telling the truth. How about 99%? Not even close. A lot of that. Not, not, not even close. I mean, not even with your own direct mail, is it that accurate? But that being said, I mean, you, you can't, and there are levels of accuracy that are very acceptable for customers. They don't expect 100% accuracy. But what they do expect is a high degree of accuracy against what they care about, which is quite often their own data. So, you know, we're we're very highly dependent on matching directly against the customer's data and allowing them to test it. I mean, we're pretty open kimono and allow them to get under the hood and look at look at the data to make sure they understand it. And, and yeah, we've actually found situations where their data is imperfect. And, and I'm sure everybody at, at, on this panel has done the same thing, actually corrected customers' data for them, right? We all provide some degree of data hygiene for our customers, which only then helps really kind of perfect that data set going forward. Amy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I was just going to comment on a couple of things. One is that use case is really important. Um, I think, you know, if a marketer is looking to um, connect disparate data sets, you're going to have to, um, in, in first party data, for example, to third party data, that first party data might not be accurate, right? You, um, we see this all the time, first party uh, data, sometimes you may have an address that was like two moves ago, and, you know, at Experian, we'll have all of those addresses, so we understand um, that we can connect those um, those households, and then use case is really important. So um, you may have different standards for targeting than you have for measurement. You may, as a marketer, want more scale when you're creating an audience, but want more accuracy when you're measuring the outcome. And so there's um, there's 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 a level of confidence that you're 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 okay with um, to create more scale versus uh, versus measurement. So the use case is really important as well. Well, let's say, hypothetically, that the use case is to measure television uh, viewing accurately, and you're looking to measure uh, an audience to a program where the highest rating is like a 0 0.03 or something like that, and everything else is lower than that, and you're going to combine it with digital, and which you know, is a much smaller thing than that. So let's use the television use case today. And so what are the most important variables we have to look at in order to ensure that we are um, 
you know, looking at relatively accurate. And I, I take your point on that, Tim. Nobody's looking for perfection, clearly, but uh, reliable, you know, repeatable, um, validated data. Who wants to take that? Only use cases television data. Well, I, I would say you'd want to start with, okay, what is the in, input of the data that you're targeting against, right? The first party data. So Tim, Amy, and Allison all said, and we've seen this before, <clears throat> explaining to a customer that they have... Um, imperfect or dirty data, that has to be cleaned up before you do a closed loop measurement campaign on TV. So you got you have to start with a good source of data. Second is TV, advanced TV means a lot of things these days, right? So match mechanisms into each type of advanced TV are very, very different. Households are very different depending on what type of TV you're looking at. If you're doing linear OTT or CTV. And you're going to get different quality of matches based off of those different channels within TV. So you can have a very strong match if you're doing a postal-based match on a subscriber file, you know, based off of a, a ton of a data spine that you have with a lot of historical consumer address data. When you're going into CTV and OTT, you're, you're not going to get that strong signal. There's going to be fewer authenticated events that you can use for that signal you're gonna be really heavily reliant on IP. So the data science mechanisms for IP look vastly different than that of you know, a linear uh, connection. So those are like two things I would call, there are many more um, when it comes to how you execute that campaign, but from the identity perspective, what's your source of data in, how clean is it, and what are like the specific channels that you're looking to measure on in TV? Cause it can mean a lot of things. Advanced TV means a lot of things these days. Yeah, with our, and, customer, and with our customers, one of the biggest concerns they have, and, and Max was right on point there, is deduplication of those audiences because the, the TV viewer is so transient in nature, right? You'll, you, I, I'm a classic example, right? I am a cord cutter's cord cutter. And yeah, I will start out watching an Ohio State football game on the big screen and carry that onto my mobile phone out to the barbecue and, and out, you know, sitting in the parking lot waiting for someone to come to the car. And so being able to deduplicate those audiences going from what was a household viewership, don't know how many people sat in front of that screen, to now somebody's viewing that same program, we think from that same household, but on a different device. Was it the same person who was sitting in front of the screen? So deduping those audiences is actually one of the trickiest things in TV because you can go from a household viewer to an individual viewer in a matter of in a matter of seconds. And that, that's where we probably spend the vast majority of our time. Once they're comfortable with the accuracy of our data, which is a whole sort of pre-setup process, then it's about how are we do deduplicating these audiences so that they can get an accurate read at the end of the day, not only on viewership, but then you know, which one of those people sat in front of that screen and ultimately ended up in a store to buy something, right? And that is that is a very, very tricky dribble for all of us to, to resolve. Yeah, that's, is, that, is that high science or high art? Yeah. Yes. Every bit of this is high science and high art. Every bit of it. Yeah, and I think we, I think it's important to also, I mean, Tim, aside from the fact that I would like to say go, go box, um, I would, uh, I would just also add that, um, you know, TV logins today are messy. And, and I think that's what Tim is really getting at is it's really, it's a really messy process. You know, I share my login with my mom, for example, who right. lives in Ohio. Um, so, you know, that, that may show up in a, in a weird way um, in an identity graph. So it's really important to have that multitude of identifiers to really help to, you know, clean up some of that data and know what to throw away, you know, what is, what, and, and that really happens in the, in the data science as well and in, in the machine learning and the algorithms that we use to make sure that you can clarify quickly um, and efficiently, what is what is um, what is good data and what is necessarily maybe noise that is not necessarily a good I identifier of that of that individual on the other side of the screen. Okay, team, isn't there some issue about what is a household? Isn't there a, a massive complexity of defining a household? What can you tell us about that? Much less a person. Yeah, historically, a household has been linked to a postal address. And there's, there, there's still very important things about postal addresses, right? There's still a lot of subscription data that's linked to, to postal addresses. And there's still a lot that can be learned from a, you know, a, a zip 11, if you will. Um, but the fluidity, the transient nature of 
the many devices that are being used, the login issue that Allison appropriately identified. I have a son in college. I don't know whose login he's using. I don't know who he's watching with. Um, which household is he supposed to be a part of, right? There's a lot of issues with, um, with households and NTV is traditionally targeted at the household level. And that's been good enough. Whereas in digital, you've targeted at the individual level, at, 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 you know, at the device level or the individual level. And, and those things are coming together and converging. And, and so there isn't often, there isn't always one right answer, right? In other words, um, a household- Just, you know, I hate it. it, but go ahead. I hate that, I interrupt yeah. you. The, the, there isn't always one right answer. A household could be fluid. A person could move. Um, and the definition of a household could be, um, you know, can be evolving as well. Yeah, we find like one of the easiest ways to identify a household right now is, is a cell phone plan. So that family plan, I think, Amy, that would be like a great way to kind of think about you and your son. You, he's pro you're probably still paying a cell, cell phone bill, um, I'm assuming. Um, but even that is changing. You know, younger consumers may still be on the family plan, even though, you know, for example, I have a 32-year-old brother-in-law who's about to get married. It's probably still on my in-law's plan, but shouldn't really be. So I think that it's, it's changing from a generational standpoint. Um, so that's why our industry has to continue to, to evolve and be up to date on, you know, what are those key identifiers? And, and again, having a multitude of, of, of choice to ensure that we clean up, you know, as things evolve, that's a little bit of the art you're kind of describing is understanding how the market is evolving, how consumer behavior is changing. How do we ensure that we use the right identifiers to help, you know, guide our, our algorithms? Yeah, my 42-year-old sister is still on my parents' plan, so... Um, there you go, yeah, great example. I, I, I understand the challenges there as well. It should be a yeah. rite of passage, right? So here you go. I think the, the key there is like, you're, you have to use more signals today yes. than what you used yeah. to use to create this household formation because it's changing and it needs to be configurable based off a of use case. So digital households for TV, for certain types of TV could be very different than terrestrial households or like address-based households for other types of TV. And they have to work together because uh, marketers don't really care about those differences. They need results at the end of the day for the use case. Will we ever get to a moment where this has been set and settled that we have the, uh, the um, pieces in place that work all the time and we can all say, oh yeah, that's how we measure all sorts of television. I think it's going to be a challenge, honestly, because of the the evolving nature of TV. I mean, you know, are we going to be watching TV on our watches eventually? Every time a new device gets introduced into the the viewing pattern, the game changes, and your ability to to and I hate to use the word track a consumer, but that's it's in essence what you're doing, whether it's through digital exhaust or other means, is always going to be evolving. So. You know, it, th this is not a game I think that will ever get settled and we'll say, finally, we're done, right? We've finally reached Nirvana and we've, we've stitched everything together perfectly and everybody must follow that plan. It's really about, and why you have a lot of smart people in this business and there'll always be a lot of smart people coming to this business with new ways to do this. It's because new ways get introduced that you have to do it. So I, I don't, personally, I don't think you're ever going to get locked and loaded on one way, one methodology that makes this a, a perfect matched world. Totally agree. Between <clears throat> the evolving ways to consume TV and the evolving privacy landscape yeah. out there, those two things alone will prohibit one standard that gets used for a long time, right? It's always going to yeah. be evolving. Yeah. Let's talk about <clears throat> privacy for a minute. Um, is the industry where it needs to be uh, protecting consumer privacy? Is what kind of work is left to do on that, and and how can we convince legislatures that that we got this? I mean, I think, yeah, I, I think the industry has <clears throat> been doing a lot of catch up, and we um, there's a lot of focus right now on on, on clean rooms and you know, trying to minimize the sharing of data, which is good. And, um, and also a lot of focus on consumer consent, which is also a good thing. I think that, you know, having consumers data is a privilege. We should treat it that way as an industry, but we should also understand that there's a value exchange and 
the consumer is benefiting from having um, some information known about them in the form of um, customized content, customized advertising and, um, and, and, and just efficiency in general. And I think, um, I don't think the industry has done a particularly good job explaining that value exchange um, to the consumer. So I think we do have, we do have a ways to go. And, um, uh, but, but, but there's a lot of eyes and there's a lot of attention on it. And then I think, and I think we're moving in the right direction. How would that work? How do you see like an ad campaign telling the consumers to, um, you know, trust us or, you know, how would that work? It's, it's education. It's education. Yep. It's absolutely education. There's a lot of free content or a lot of free tools that are supported by advertising and, um, and, and consumers have become accustomed to that. But, um, but, but, you know, some uh, understanding of who a consumer is at some level is, is, is required for that advertising to be effective. Yeah, I agree yeah, with Amy. You know, like, I, think, I, I think the right thing is putting tools in the consumer's hands because no, no matter how hard you try to legislate this, bad actors are gonna find a way to beat legislation every day, right? It just, it's gonna happen. Um, I think it's really more about how do we, how, educating consumers, but putting real tools in their hands that they can understand. Half the tools we put in their hands today, they don't even know how to use or can't read, right? So I, I think that's where the focus uh, in the industry should be is more how do we really empower the consumer to make the right choices, not treat them as idiots, obviously, um, but you know, give them things that are dummy proof that, that they can they can make really really substantial choices from. Tools like what, Tim? Uh, I mean, ju just let's start with simple disclosures, right? If you log on to download any app, whether it's on TV or on your mobile device, I, I challenge you to read that agreement top to bottom and make a wise choice about whether or not they're using your data properly. Right, so just breaking things down into plain English would be a great start, but you know, unfortunately, that's driven by lawyers, not by people at this table, and that that is where the world starts to slide backwards, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree. I think you don't always know as a consumer what you're consenting to. Right. Um, you you're looking at the content on the other side of that yeah. uh, consent flow. Yeah. So um, you there there has to be better tools to understand what you're consenting to, as well as being able to take control if you want to change your mind in the future about what you've consented to. Like, how, how do I know where to go to do that? Excellent. We have uh, under two minutes left to go in our panel. Um, I think I would like to address walled gardens and our ability to see uh, a true journey, a true uh, tracking of the consumer behavior through the entire ecosystem. What are the challenges and how are we going to get around that? Oh, there's one minute left to go in our panel. Yeah, Alice, I can jump in. So, you know, we, we look at this challenge both across TV and digital. Um, so, you know, we've done a lot at New Star to invest in differential privacy. Amy mentioned a little bit around clean rooms, but I mean, effectively, there's there are data science techniques that we've really invested heavily in to enable that data sharing in a privacy safe and a privacy forward way. Um, so, for example, you know, we've built with um, with some of the walled gardens, we've built cohort based integrations that still enable us to share data in a, in a way that, you know, obfuscates and, and hides some of the consumer detail and the user detail, but still allows us to see that touch point and see how it could, you know, ultimately drive to a conversion. So I think that there is a lot of um, continue there will continue to be a lot of innovation in the space around, you know, data science techniques and things like differential privacy, which allow us to do some of this data sharing, um, even within the walled gardens. You know, I think it all comes down to, you know, what are the use cases we're trying to, to deliver for the marketer? And, I, and, you know, we find that through these partnerships that we've seen a lot of these walled gardens would be really engaged and excited about being able to share data, but without, you know, we're still protecting their users' privacy. Excellent. Shall we stop there? Does anyone want to have the last word on uh, where we are on television? Seeing none, moved and seconded. Thank you so much for participating in this uh, panel. Sim really appreciates it. I appreciate your willingness to talk publicly about everything we're doing here and how important it is. And I, I thank you very much, all of you. Good job. Thank you. Thanks for thank having me. Thanks, Alice. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to Jim, Alice, Max, Amy, Allison, and Tim for that really fascinating discussion. Huge